Here we're going to talk about nuclear magnetic resonance, abbreviated NMR. We've talked about transitions between electronic spin states, where we have a spin one half. We put that spin one half into a magnetic field, and the energy levels split. Well, it turns out that nuclei also have a nuclear spin. And if you put the nuclei in a magnetic field, these nuclear energy levels, which are normally degenerate, will split. So some nuclei have a nuclear spin. And instead of using the symbol S, which we used for electron spin, we're going to use the symbol I. But other than that, it's about the same. Suppose, for example, we have I equal 1 half corresponding to a spin one-half nucleus. That would mean that we have two values of m sub i. m sub i could be plus one-half and minus one-half. Half. Very similar to s equal one-half. s equal one-half, m sub s equal plus or minus one-half. i equal one-half, m sub i equal plus or minus one-half. So I can uh, range from, say, 0. Of course, you can already have a spin of 0. We can have a nuclear spin of 1 half. We can have a nuclear spin of 2 halves, 3 halves, and so on. So nuclei are fermions. They can have half integer spin, and they can have it all the way up to this way. Protons, common spins. Let's look at proton. Proton have a spin of I equal 1 half. Let's look at carbon-13. Carbon-13 has a nuclear spin equal to 1 half. Let's look at nitrogen-14, common isotope of nitrogen. Nuclear spin here is 1, and so on. So different nuclei have different spins. Let's look at carbon-12. Carbon-12, the nuclear spin of carbon-12 is 0. What does that mean? Well, there are no energy levels here to split, and therefore, carbon-12 you cannot do an NMR experiment on because there's no nuclei. Let's see if we can predict the nuclear spin of a particular isotope. Here's a list of isotopes of iron. Iron has quite a few isotopes. And here's the nuclear spin. Iron has an atomic number of 26. So let's see if we can see a correlation. Well, here it looks like nuclear spin is 0 for mass numbers even. 52, 54 is a nuclear spin, 56 nuclear spin 0, 58 nuclear spin 0, and so on. So all the even mass numbers, since the atomic number of iron is 26, that's an even number, Therefore, you have an even mass number. You have an even number of neutrons. If you have an even, at least for iron, if you have an even number of neutrons and an even number of protons, it looks like the nuclear spin will be zero. In fact, that's about it for predicting the nuclear spin. If you have an even number of protons and even number of neutrons, you're guaranteed to have a nuclear spin of zero. For example, carbon-12, there are six protons and six neutrons, and that's an even number, and so carbon-12 has a nuclear spin of zero. Carbon-13, on the other hand, has seven neutrons and six protons, and therefore the nuclear spin is not guaranteed to be zero there, and in fact, it's just equal to one-half. Well, maybe we can try to figure out something else. Uh, for example, protons have nuclear spin of 1 half, and also neutrons have a nuclear spin of 1 half. So you might expect that if you have an even number of protons and even number of neutrons, the spins will all cancel out, and that will give you a nuclear spin of 0. Well, if that's the case, let's look at here, say, oxygen-16. Oxygen-16, atomic number 8, means an even number of protons, 8, and an even number of neutrons. Uh, that's also 8, so the nuclear spin there is 0. Now, when we go from oxygen-16 to oxygen-17, what we're doing is adding one more neutron, so we'd expect that perhaps since everything was canceled out, we add more, one more thing of the spin one half. The nuclear spin of oxygen 17 with one more neutron should be one half. But in fact, the nuclear spin is not one half for oxygen 17. It's five halves. So given our knowledge of chemistry and without a calculation of nuclear properties and so on, we can't really predict except for the case where you have an even number of neutrons and even number of protons, we can predict the nuclear spin is zero, but for other cases, it's not really clear. Note that oxygen 18, which is very low abundance, 
or actually is more naturally abundant than oxygen 17. Oxygen 18 has an even number of neutrons. It has eight, uh, 10 neutrons, and the protons is 8. So that's even, even. That has a nuclear spin of 0. But just add, subtract one more neutron. The spin doesn't go to a half. It goes to 5 halves. All right, so let's uh, look at a spin one-half nucleus. In the absence of a magnetic field, we're looking at here, energy goes up this way. In the absence of a magnetic field, you have two different values of m sub i. m sub i equal plus one-half or minus one-half. You now put this in a magnetic field. These energy levels split like this, where now this m sub i is equal to minus one-half, and m sub i here is plus one-half. Remember, it was just reversed for the case of an electron. For an electron, the higher energy had m sub i equal plus one-half. Now for the nucleus, m sub i is equal to minus one-half. And here we have plus one-half. Of course, this may change uh, depending upon other factors, which will talk about in just a minute. But what I'm trying to say here is this is very similar to what we've already talked about for electron spin resonance. The actual change in energy with magnetic field B is given by this equation. Now let's write that here. So delta E or here where again we're saying this is delta E. Delta E is equal to a nuclear G factor times the Bohr nuclear, actually, for the nuclei, this is given a symbol mu sub n, times the magnetic field times the quantum number m sub i. Just to remind you, for a ESR experiment, this would be the electron times the Bohr magneton times the magnetic field times m sub s. And for electronic splitting, we had delta E was equal to G sub j mu sub b b times m sub j. So very similar phenomenon going on here. Normally degenerate energy levels are split when you put them in a magnetic field and the general relationship between the energy level splittings is the same whether you're talking about nuclear magnetic resonance, electron spin resonance, or the electronic spectroscopy, electronic transitions. Now what you do in a nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy is that you look at transitions between nuclear spin energy levels. The selection rule here is delta m sub i has to be plus or minus 1. In other words, some nuclear orientation given by m sub i has to change. Note there's no zero here like we had for the electronic spectroscopy. All right, so our selection rule is delta m sub i equal plus or minus 1. Let's look at this possible transition between spin states. Here we go from a plus 1 half to a minus 1 half. Yes, this is allowed. If you just have an isolated bare proton hanging out in space, the spectrum intensity versus frequency, you'll get a single peak for this proton corresponding to a transition between nuclear energy states. So let's rewrite that equation and get it in a form which a lot of people use here. So the splitting in energy levels. So we rewrite this uh, energy level splitting here. Delta E is the nuclear G factor times the nuclear Bohr magneton or the nuclear magneton times the magnetic field times this m sub i value here. Okay, so we said that the splitting for spin one half, this is what delta E is, and m sub i here was minus one half, and m sub i here is plus one half. So that delta E, so the total delta E here, if we look at the energy level transition, that delta E will be, well, it's 1 half plus 1 half. So this delta E for that transition for spin 1 half particle, spin 1 half nucleus, is just G sub n, mu sub n, b for this particular transition. Now, let us uh, rewrite this, or let's write in what E is equal to, or E is equal to, this is equal to, h bar omega. So we can rewrite this as the frequency of that corresponding to this transition between spin states is equal to the nuclear g factor times the magnetic or the nuclear magneton divided by h bar times b. These are a bunch of constants for a given nucleus and therefore we're going to give it another symbol. <laughs> this will be gamma. This is called the gyromagnetic ratio. Why is it called that? 
Well, if we have now omega equals gamma b, so we said the this is equal to omega over b, and gyro refers to frequency and magnetic refers to this, so it's gyro magnetic ratio. Now the gyro magnetic ratio is characteristic of a particular nucleus. So for example, if we go back and look at our table here, the proton, the H1, which has a spin of one half, will have a different gyro magnetic ratio compared to C13, spin one half, compared to nitrogen 14, spin equal one, and so on. So each nucleus will have a different characteristic gyro magnetic ratio. So this depends on the nucleus. And therefore, there'll be a different proportionality between magnetic field and frequency. So if there, is there one equation you remember for magnetic reson resonance? This should be it. The frequency of an absorption depends upon magnetic field. Well, let's look at a little bit here. So here we have, for example, the frequency. Well, let's make it uh, delta E. That's the energy level separation, which will be h bar omega. And plot this as a function of magnetic field. And for spin one-half particle, we have two energy levels. At zero magnetic field, these energy levels are degenerate. Now, as we increase the magnetic field, what we do is we increase the energy level separation. So this will be delta E, and that energy level separation depends on magnetic field. If you double the magnetic field, you double the energy level separation. So this is the key equation here, and you might want to remember that. The frequency of the absorption transition is proportional to magnetic field. The proportionality constant is the gyro magnetic ratio, which is a characteristic of each nucleus. So let's do a couple examples here. Uh, the resonance frequency of our NMR instrument in the department is 600 megahertz. What is the magnetic field of the instrument? So we're given 600 megahertz, that's the so-called resonance frequency, or the resonance frequency, I suppose you might as well say what this is. This is called the so-called resonance frequency. It's also called the Larmor frequency. So when we have a problem, the resonance frequency of the proton, that means the actual frequency at which the absorption occurs. Now, 600 megahertz is the resonance frequency. So we have the one equation we have to remember, omega equals gamma h, or sorry, gamma b. I used to call magnetic field h, so now <laughs> in this new notation, I'm calling it b, so b. Or in other words, we want to know what the magnetic field is. That's equal to the frequency over the gyro magnetic ratio. The frequency is 600 megahertz, and let's look up to see what the gyro magnetic ratio is for protons. Here is the Wikipedia article, and this these numbers look okay. These are the gyro magnetic ratios for the different kinds of nuclei that have a non-zero spin. This is the gyro magnetic ratio in terms of radian per second per tesla, and this is the gyro magnetic ratio in terms of megahertz per tesla. Which unit we want to use? Well, we have megahertz up here, so let's go ahead and use this. And for a proton, 42.576. This is 42.576. And the units there were megahertz per tesla. And we put this in our calculators and we get 14.1 tesla. So for a proton to absorb at 600 megahertz, we have to have a magnetic field of 14.1 tesla. Now let's uh, do the second example here. In the same instrument, this 600 megahertz NMR instrument, which by the way, if you have different NMR instruments, they're usually labeled by megahertz, a certain megahertz, and that megahertz is the resonance frequency of a proton. So now we're going to look at uh, what is the resonance frequency of C13 in this 600 megahertz instrument, 600 megahertz referring to protons. All right, so let's look at carbon-13. So we want the resonance frequency of carbon-13. Here we have to have the gyromagnetic ratio of carbon-13 times the magnetic field. Same instrument is 14.1 tesla. So let's go to the Wikipedia article and see what the gyromagnetic ratio of carbon-13 is. And again, we want it in megahertz, so let's use this. 10.705 megahertz per tesla. And the magnetic field, we just said, was 14.1 tesla. So the frequency of absorption there is 92.1 megahertz. Several things to notice. It's lower uh, frequency than here, which means the energy level separation when you put carbon-13 into a magnetic field is less than the separation you get for the protons because you get absorption at lower energy. 
Secondly, you could sort of look at that because the gyromagnetic ratio of protons is 42, whereas that of carbon-13 is just 10, it's about one-fourth. So this would resonate at a lower frequency because it has a forgiven magnetic field because it has a lower gyromagnetic ratio. Another way to do that problem is to say, well, the frequency of carbon-13 divided by the frequency, the resonance frequency of protons, is equal to the gyromagnetic ratio of carbon-13 times the magnetic field divided by the gyromagnetic ratio of protons times the magnetic field. And we uh, put in these numbers here, the gyromagnetic ratio of protons, what we say was, let's look it up again, 42.576 times the magnetic field. For C13, it was 10.705 magnetic field and the magnetic field is the same it's all both in the same instrument so the uh, we can say that the resonance frequency of carbon 13 is equal to the resonance frequency of 1h times the gyromagnetic ratio 10.705 divided by 42.576 and this comes out to be 92.1 megahertz what's the take-home message here that the frequency of absorption is proportional to magnetic field and that the proportionality constant, the gyromagnetic ratio, is characteristic of a given nucleus. Now let's go back to the Wikipedia article and take a look at these gyromagnetic ratios. Well, this is interesting. So this is for nitrogen 15. The gyromagnetic ratio here is 27.16, but oh, hmm, here it's negative. All right, this, the only thing you did here was change the units, 10 to the 6 radian per second, and here is in megahertz. And you got went from there to there by dividing by 2 pi, since there are 2 pi radians per 1 hertz, 1 cycle. All right, so what's uh, going on here? Well, I think that this might be in error. Yes, Wikipedia is not perfect, and it has some errors in it. Okay, so let's uh, look more closely at what gyromagnetic ratio means. If one has a spinning charge, and this is a classical explanation, so one here has a spinning charge, this is the nucleus, and this charge has an, there's an intrinsic spin, so you can imagine the nucleus spinning around its own axis. That's a very bad analogy, but it seems to work, and this then has a positive charge. What one generates when one spins a, a, a charge is you generate a magnetic field, and the magnetic field can be described in terms of magnetic dipole. So the magnetic dipole, this is dipole, magnetic dipole, generated by the spin is proportional to the uh, spin, uh, actually spin on the nucleus. So this is the nuclear spin. So to make sense, if you have a bigger nuclear spin, then you'd have generate a bigger magnetic, bigger magnetic dipole. And the proportionality constant here is gamma, and this is the magneto-gyric ratio, or the gyro-magneto ratio. So we can rewrite this as the gyromagnetic ratio is equal to the dipole moment generated by the spinning nucleus divided by the nuclear spin. And the nuclear spin, this always has to be greater than zero. It's one half, one, one and a half, or it could greater than or equal to zero. But if it's equal to zero, you don't have a gyromagnetic ratio. So in fact, just let's say greater than zero for spins, for things that generate a magnetic moment. Now, if we found for 15n, the gyromagnetic ratio was less than zero. What does that implies, since this is greater than zero, that the magnetic dipole moment generated by the spinning nucleus is less than zero. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the nucleus is spinning, say, one way, will generate a field going one direction, but if it spins the other way, it'll generate a field going the other direction. Saying that the gyromagnetic ratio is less than zero implies that the nuclear magnetic moment is less than zero. Well, this, let's see that. Here it is in web elements. For the nitrogen-15 nucleus, the nuclear magnetic moment, yes, is negative. That's different from the nitrogen-14 nucleus where the nuclear magnetic moment is positive. What this means is that the, since the nuclear magnetic moment is negative, the magnetogyric ratio or the gyromagnetic ratio is negative. And in fact, the Wikipedia article is incorrect. Since nitrogen-15 has a negative nuclear magnetic moment, this number should be negative. Right, so uh, <laughs> even though Wikipedia is oftentimes right, especially in the sciences, sometimes it's wrong.